Lucy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima, the podcast about machinima, virtual production, and related technologies. I'm your host, Phil Rice, here with my co-hosts, Damian Valentine and Tracy Harwood. Hello. Ricky is off working on his cottage cheese sculpture. Uh, he'll be doing a tutorial video for that to share with all of us, so uh, be on the lookout for that. It's uh, It'll be exciting to see his techniques there. In the meantime, we're going to cover some news, and uh, Tracy, why don't you kick us off? Sure. Um, well, thanks to Evan Ryan for reminding us about Reillusion's 2024 3D character contest. I think, unfortunately for you, our viewers, uh, by the time you pick this up, the deadline will have passed because it closed on the 1st of September. It's a real shame. But for those of you that did manage to get something in, um, I think we'll be very much looking forward to see it. I'm guessing, Evan, you're one of those that are that, that is submitting to it. So we will look forward to seeing what it is you put in. Um, there's some fantastic entries in it. Um, Phil puts um, the entry page up on our um, preparation board here for for the for the show. Um, I've had a look through some of those. There's one that really stood out for me, which was Stefan Dufour's last chrome chromion, I think. Um, but yeah, amazing bits of work. I really look forward to seeing um, seeing what people do with that. So you've looked through some of the entries so far, then. I have indeed. Yeah. 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 So it's it's now. Is it a little bit more evident why when you suggested that I enter? I guess that I said I I probably should not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> some amazing. There's a variety of quality, but the the, the top tier entries so far just. Really amazing stuff. People using ZBrush to to create these very customized characters and bringing them in, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's a whole skill set there that uh, it's exciting to. See. I'm I'm glad they're doing this. I wish that they would do contests of this kind for iClone itself. It's been a while since I've seen anything like that, but you know, I, I the character creator. There's a broader audience for character creator users, because people are using this to create characters for all different kinds of platforms. So it makes sense that they would would uh, um, center a contest around this. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see the the uh, the entries as they come in. Yeah. Do you know when they're going to be out, the, the, the final? I don't. You figure if the deadline is September 1st, that means most people will be submitting their final entries on September 1st. <laughs> so <laughs> probably be a little bit of time to review it and uh i would i would expect mid-september yeah oh, okay yeah maybe well, by the time this episode's out who knows possibly yeah no, possibly. we may be we may be doing a little time travel here <laughs> excellent all right the next bit of news that i picked up on is um to do with skibbity toilet which as you are aware has been made using half-life 2 and counter-strike assets and it would appear that the creator, who is Alexei Ger Gerasimov, apologies for the pronunciation, is in talks um, for a Michael Bay movie. Can you believe that? No. Hmm. I cannot. <laughs> I still can't get my head around that. <laughs> anyway. Um, wow. This, yeah. I, I don't not... understand Skibbity Toilet. I, I think I may just be too old. I probably need to ask my kids. Uh, one's a teenager, one's at university. Be interesting to see if they even admit that they know what it is, but I have a feeling they do. <laughs> and I, when, when they explain I see it, it everywhere you, and I don't understand it. Yeah. When they explain it to you, can you then explain it to us so that we can understand it I will. It as well? I will. <laughs> yeah. We'll do a little... What I'll do is I'll do a... Uh, we, we talked a couple episodes back about the 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 dearth of video essays i'll do a video essay on a, an old dad learning about skibbity toy i'm actually not joking that's actually a really good idea i'm gonna do that oh my god i'm gonna do that yeah look out look, for that i will look forward to seeing that i will look forward to seeing it too 
uh, the other thing I would say I was going to say about it is that actually, because um, it's machinima videos that he's creating, this Alexi, apparently the influence for it is Gary's mod. Who knew? But speaking about Gary's mod, its spiritual successor sandbox is now available for everyone to use as well. It's being positioned in a similar way to Roblox, um, and it's being targeted at the user-generated content market. It's been built in Source 2 engine. So um, apparently, as I understand it, what they are trying to do with the launch of Sandbox is to de-emphasize the link to Valve's games for machinima production, which is an interesting take. So if you were listening to our uh, our year in review discussion, particularly in relation to Unreal, to 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 you know to think about why an engine would do that and what the implications of that might be is kind of interesting now to see source doing something similar i think yeah we'll see what happens with that because of course source is not as easy allegedly as unreal or iclone or others perhaps i don't know so we'll see what what happens with this launch of this spiritual successor to Gary's it's a smart mod. move on their it, part because one thing you can say for Gary's mod is that it's it has been you know because it was built on kind of as a like a barnacle on on the Half Life Two world many many times the really the only characters you ever see in it are characters that are straight out of the Half Life Two story so there's a lot of G Man videos there's some with Alex there's some of those stock. Uh, characters from the Half-Life 2 world and stuff, and from the screenshot that comes article that you, you referenced, which uh, we'll, uh, we'll include in our show notes, uh, it certainly doesn't look anything like the characters from Half-Life 2. Mm. Um, they're yeah. more stylized. Um, there's nothing nothing Half-Life 2-ish about it. And that's that's I think that only will lead to good things in terms of... of uh, it, I mean, Gary's mod creators have been very, very creative, and they've had very limited guardrails in place all this time for how many years now? Over well over a decade. So I think it's an interesting move, and frankly, going for if they are indeed going for more of like a uh, a Roblox aesthetic, um, that's smart for a number of reasons. One, that means generally probably lower poly, lower performance needed to get good performance out of it. I mean, Roblox is kind of in the same tier, pretty much the same graphical tier as like Minecraft or something like that. And it's enjoyed by a giant yes. audience. Yeah, giant. And Roblox has this whole development platform that is reputedly very easy to use compared to other platforms for developing your own experiences to share with others in Roblox. I think that's really what, I mean, that's the heart of what's kept it going. So, mm. yeah, it's, uh, I mean, the, they developed it in source, so I guess it's not going to be part of Roblox, but that's, a, I think that's a smart move to appeal to that audience. Because again, it's just, it's huge, gigantic. Yeah, it is. Um, let's see what happens with it. I'm quite in, kind of intrigued yeah. to see how that one unfolds. And then in, in another sort of source related news, I found a really cool video paying homage to the Team Fortress 2 creator community. I think it's an absolute must-see for any TF2 fans um, that, that are out there. It's been edited to Freebird. It, it's really, really good fun. You'll see some of the, the videos, the machinimas that we've reviewed also in that um, promo vid, really. Um, and that's it for me this month. So what have you guys brought? Damien, you want to go next? Yeah, okay. Well, the Got a number of stories here. The first one is a little bit of a, a downer, really. Um, but it kind of goes with uh, what we just talked about, how the, the Gary's mod's moving away from Half-Life. So um, Activision have shut down a mod for one of the Call of Duty games because uh, my understanding was they were moving maps from one Call of Duty from an older game to the new one, upscaling the graphics to match the new one, or something along those lines. I, I don't play Call of Duty, so I, I'm not too up on the specifics of this mod. But so Activision shut it down because they're worried it would impact 
the sales of their upcoming um, game uh, later this year. So basically, that's a big no for modding Call of Duty games. And uh, they kind of have a history of that because, you know, Call of Duty games come out every year and they don't want modders prolonging the life of these games, which I think that's a, that's, that's a silly attitude, really, because modders do prolong the life of the game. But when you release a new game, they're mm-hmm. going to move over to that anyway. If the game's as good as it's meant to be, then you're going to... That hardcore audience is going to... Well, the audience is going to move to the new game. And so why not let mods but just keep it interesting in between? It's very strange. This, the, this is not the first developer that's taken what I would consider an unusual stance with regard to modding. Uh, Bethesda, of course, I think they've kind of got a history of making weird decisions there. It's all with Bethesda, everyone seems to suspect Bethesda is the maker of what? Uh, Fallout, Red Skyrim. Dead. No, no, no. Red Dead oh, is a uh, Rockstar yes, game. Rockstar, yeah. of course, yeah. Um and, Starfield. <clears throat> and Starfield, yeah. And basically they've with Bethesda, they've taken moves that kind of make it seem like that they're out to try and somehow monetize the user-made mods or it's something money related, of course. But yeah, some strange moves there where it, it the the end result is it 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 inhibits the proliferation of those mods. And yeah, I I think that's a really weird move. Um and and seems to go against the current that has been set up. Really, Rockstar has led the way. You know, they're they're certainly not a flawless company or anything, but you know, the, the, they they seem to love nothing more than to have people mod the GTA games, for example. And they've got a lot at stake for GTA 6. You don't see them doing anything like that to, to you know, step on the, on the hose for GTA 5 mods. And GTA 5 mods have definitely kept that game alive longer than it probably would have, you know? So yeah. that's a strange move. I, I, I don't know. The thing I noticed with Bethesda, especially with Starfield, is they've got the the built-in mod finder in the game, which they released about a month or so ago. Mm. And so mod creators can charge points, which you then have to pay real money for. But what a lot of mod creators are doing is they're opting to make their mods free. There are a few paid mods in there. Some are officially sanctioned by Bethesda, and there are a few creators who are opting to go for the paid route. But a lot are just saying, no, we're just going to make it free, which I think, you know, that's a good thing. Make make the mods free. Well, it's a way of making a statement too. A re- that's a response of sorts to yeah to those moves it's... is is basically. And not all of us are interested in that. And I think the same yeah. is true for the Minecraft modding community, which is gigantic, just gigantic. And there's whole third party platforms set up to distribute those. And I think the way that the most popular, one of the more popular Minecraft modding platforms, the name is eluding me right now. My son would would smack me for not knowing, but. But basically, they've they've somehow set up a way to where the creators of mods uh, have a revenue sharing situation, but they don't charge any money for the mods. I don't know how quite how that works. If it's like an ad revenue share thing or something, I don't really know exactly how the economics of that works. But uh, experiments like those where they're like leaning the other direction, right? It, it's the emphasis is on rewarding the creators of mods, not not discouraging them. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a weird move. I I don't mean this in any kind of malicious way, but I kind of hope it doesn't work well for them because then maybe they'll learn. Activision, I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently the game that was being modded is now being massively review bombed by all the people that were looking forward to uh, that mod. <laughs> and I'd say, well, why not? Because people have been buying, they actually specifically bought, I think it was a, a remaster of an old game and the, they were bringing some maps over to, I don't know exactly, but it's being review bombed because some people actually bought this remaster specifically for this mod that was coming out. And obviously now they can't wow. play it. So, um, yeah, I don't understand it either. And obviously, modding is a big part of the machinery community. Uh, it's huge. Yeah, it's well, it basically started off as modding. So yeah, yeah. In uh, our reflection episode, Tracy, uh, there was a, a point that came up, and I was going to comment, and we ran out of time. But uh, you had mentioned how, like, the early we were. Oh no, it wasn't the uh, 
reflection episode. It was reviewing uh, Ricky's pick, the the video essay about the origins or the history mm. of machinima. Mm -hmm. And you'd mentioned how that he kind of glossed over the fact that the early machinima creators, if they needed something in the game and they didn't have it, they made it and then figured out how to get it into the game and how that's much less a thing now. I'm not sure if it's less a thing now. Mm. It's just that one person or one team doesn't... It's been specialized is what's happened because the modding communities have just exploded. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. If you look at the site nexusmods.com, there's like, I don't know, a hundred games on there and just tons and tons and tons and tons of mods, all free. So those are people who used to be, you used to have to have that skill to be able to pull off machinima. And now a lot of machinima makers rely on those mods. So it's almost a, an unofficial partnership with these modders that they may not have ever even met that are doing that part of the work. And then the the filmmakers can can exploit those and use them. I think that that Red Dead Redemption 2 video that we seem to bring up regularly where it takes place in that dream world, mm -hmm. used a ton of different mods, none of which were made by the filmmaker. Mm -hmm. He just implemented them into his game and then exploited them. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's a lot of that going on. I know that everything that I've made in in any video game, just about everything I've made has relied on that someone else made a mod to allow certain things to happen. Certainly that's true in The Sims. For almost all the Sims, uh, like the current the current crop of Sims 4, mm -hmm. Machinima people, yeah, they're making use of custom content that were that's been sub, kind of subcontracted to, to someone else. Usually, content that's already been created by those people for other reasons, and they're using that in their game. So, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I want to get the downer out of the way. We'll get to some more positive news now. So, um, at the time of recording, Gamescom um, has just happened in cologne germany it's a big uh video game conference and companies are there showing off the latest games so there's a couple of things i spotted watching the the, the big opening night thing and i want to share them here with all of you guys so we've got the the dragon age uh the veil guard which is the fourth dragon age game uh, it's got an official release date which is halloween now the reason i mentioned this is because the first the very first dragon age game it a lot of people from our community went to work on it. Um, I don't know how many yeah. of them are still there working on it, but it was a very cinematic uh, fantasy role-playing experience. It is For those of us who didn't go and work at Bioware, this and Mass Effect were heavily influential and inspirational on us as creators because they did things that other games hadn't done with storytelling before because the cutscenes looked like... Oh, they changed the, they changed the whole landscape of what's yeah. expected from games cinematically yes yeah. and this looks no different if watching the trailers for it i'm excited for this game and it looks like it's going to be just as cinematic as the previous entries and so i thought it's worth mentioning because it's it was a big part of the machinery community i don't is know dragon age gonna... is dragon age still a uh, bioware title oh yeah okay um they've Very worked cool. on it for the last eight years i think whoa yeah <laughs> which uh I'm more of a Mass Effect fan, and I know I've got a very long wait for the next one of those. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'll play this. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be much of a machinima tool because I think it's going to be very focused on its own story. But, you know, I can play it and get inspiration from it rather than make it absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, I, I thought I'd mention that one. Uh, the next one, it was a teaser trailer that was released during the, over the uh, opening night ceremony it's called secret level now this is a series that's going to be on amazon prime i believe it's in december and the idea was they looked at people who played games and were inspired by the cinematic quality of some of these games and said i wish this was something you just watch and so they've gone to a number of different video game companies and they've produced uh, an anthology series focusing on a number of different games and they've made stories that you can just sit down and watch. They're all animated. I don't think they're machinima, but I still thought it's a way to see video games turn into yeah. uh, an animated uh, series. Yeah. It's by the same people who did the Love, Death and Robots series. Mm, right. uh, same people who did that. I have to admit, I didn't recognize all the games I saw in the trailer, but um, I think I'm still going to watch it anyway because it did look like it would be a very interesting 
series. Um, so that's coming in December. The trailer doesn't really give away much. It's just a teaser. Wonder what uh, engines are are involved there. Uh, if if I, I wonder if uh, Unreal Engine will have been involved, or if they're going to be doing it more traditional, like with Maya or something like that. That'll be interesting to see what we can find out when it comes out. Yeah, I'll be keeping an eye on it. But yeah, it looks very good. So hopefully they were behind the scenes to how they did it. And the next thing, it's a game called, and I hope I get this right, Inzoi. It's sort of like The Sims. And at the time of recording, there's actually yeah, a character created demo. Unfortunately, by the time you hear this, it's going to be disappeared because they've made it a time-limited experience. And there's no release date for the game itself. But what it looks like is The Sims, but they've done away with all the over the top exaggerated animations and everything. It's much more grounded. And obviously, yay! <laughs> the Sims 4 is not a new game anymore. So this looks a lot more visually impressive, more realistic. Um, I did give the demo a try. It's not optimized that well for my computer. So it didn't run that smoothly, but it just lets you create a character. And there's a sort of cutscene that going into an office, and there's a cat that had some very impressive fur effects on it. And the cat's talking to you about the... Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so it's going to be a Sims-type game. And we know that The Sims is a very popular mission at all because uh, you've got the character customization. You've got the building. You can you know, you know build your sets and environments. And then you've got the camera tools. I don't know how what the camera tools in this game are going to be like, but it does have the character creator, as we know from the demo. And it's got the, the house building stuff in it. So I'm quite intrigued to see where this is going to go and i think they might be worth keeping an eye on uh but yeah you, you won't be able to try the demo out when you hear this but uh, hopefully they optimize it a bit better uh before release because i like the, the lighting in the it. screenshots the lighting looks just gorgeous yeah i was quite impressed by the the style of it and the, the uh videos i've seen and the characters are moving like real people rather than flailing around excitedly because something's happened uh you know what i mean they're the Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that's my news. Uh, I did see lots of other games, uh, games come that I'm looking forward to playing. But don't think they've got that much machinima potential, but you never know. So yeah, that's it for me for news this month. All right. Well, uh, I've got a couple uh, things to close us out. Uh, both of them uh, AI related. Uh, the first, I'll just quick mention. Uh, so j yesterday, I decided to finally sit down and teach Daz studio i've 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 always wanted to to incorporate that into my pipeline somehow i think that there's some good possibilities there for leveraging leveraging items in their content store which are significantly less expensive than uh their counterparts let's say in reillusion zone store so it's a maybe a good opportunity there not just to bring in some interesting looking characters, but accessories and props and maybe even some environments and things like that. So yesterday I sat down and decided to teach myself that. Well, while I was on their uh, website, I noticed a tab for uh, that basically referenced AI. And I was just curious, what what do they have to do with that? Well, they have a uh, a generative AI platform on... Uh, on their website, it's subscription based, but I think you could try it for free. That uses a an aesthetic that is similar to the Daz Studio aesthetic, which at the you know at the the eye ray render quality that you can do with an RTX card is very very high quality render. Um, and the the thing that that jumped out to me because I mean, quite frankly, now just about everybody has a a generative AI engine, right? It's it's mm. the thing. Uh, but for the paid ones, theirs is pretty cheap. It's like, I don't know, if, I want to say $4 a month. Oh, wow. Which is I a see. lot less expensive than um, than Leonardo, for example, or, mm. um, you know, MidJourney can get pretty, pretty expensive uh, if you're going to use it a lot. So it looked interesting. Now, I, I would imagine, I haven't tested it, but I would imagine that it's probably, it's a limited scope situation um given that it's focusing on the the daz uh aesthetic so it's probably not quite as broad a generation engine as the others would be where you can pretty much generate anything 
but it might be something of interest um, to, for people to check out. They don't have a, a text to video at this point. It's just text to image. They are planning to add image to image and some other other features like that. Some some uh, style transfer things, which the style transfer might be very interesting for that. But uh, anyway, just thought I'd mention that that's a thing. It's called Daz AI Studio, uh, and uh, it's on their on their website right now. The other thing AI related is you've heard me mention many times over the years uh, uh, a composer um, that I know, Sasha. Mm -hmm. uh, um, German composer. He was he was running for years a site called filmmusic.io, and he's had some some challenges with the site. One of which is the Hugh Hancock challenge, uh, which is you know Hugh was a filmmaker first and foremost, but decided to devote a large portion of his life for several years to running Machinima.com for the benefit of other filmmakers, and that began to eat up his life and energy that he wanted to devote to his own films. And Sasha's in the same boat. He's running this site. There were other artists on there, my, myself included at, at one point, um, who could host their music. And it was a creative commons type of thing that someone could, could voluntarily pay for an extended license, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, the first issue that he ran into was that one of his one of the major composers that had one of the larger catalogs on his site decided to put all their music into YouTube's content ID system, which significantly messed with the Creative Commons distribution that that the site had promised. And so he started getting all these inquiries in from people who their video flagged by YouTube and for video for for music that they had uh, that they had downloaded under a creative commons agreement. So he got really discouraged by that and <laughs> and actually his, his ultimately his response was to kick all of us off of the site, all the other composers. He was just really really aggravated about that. Uh and just make the site about his own music. And that was only earlier this year that that happened. Well then since then he put up a post that basically, uh, unfortunately, the post is not available now because he's already reworked the site. But he basically outlined that uh, the, the, the quote that stood out to me was, the passion that once fueled my work has been eroded by a landscape that no longer values the, the art in the same way. I will always love music, but the time has come to acknowledge that this chapter of my life is coming to an end. And this is not an old man. Uh, this is a young man. Uh, I, I I would guess that he's in his late thirties. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but um, he's 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 not elderly and like preparing for the end of life or something. It's he's just really discouraged by what has happened to the way music is is valued and and the transactional value of music has just plummeted. Uh, this happened all before AI. But I think AI, with with the latest AI generated music, he's facing a similar anxiety that we've talked about visual artists have about generative AI visual art. And uh, so he basically decided to just, he got so discouraged by that, uh, first of all, by the general expectation from everyone that they should just get whatever they want for free. Which yeah, that's 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 challenging, but then on top of that, now anyone can just go make their own music with AI, and you know I think he's he's struggling with the feeling of being outmoded. So that was the original story, and he actually his final his final song on the website was called "Time to Say Goodbye," and he used an AI music generator to make the song. <laughs> Just as an aside, he's a really good composer, and his AI song was terrible, terrible, unlistenable to me. But okay, maybe, and I'm thinking, well, maybe he's doing it ironically, you know, as kind of a a finger in the air to the whole AI music community. And that's what I thought, is this is his way of signing off with a with a flourish. But then I went and visited the site just shortly before we went to produce the show here. And uh, yeah, he's he's re, 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 reworked it, as he said, and you can still download all his old music under Creative Commons. 
but he's released several pieces of new music and all of them AI generated. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't quite know what to make of that. It's it's odd. Anyway, I, the part that was compelling to me originally with this story was this kind of a sad story of this is a very talented composer uh, you know this is one of the the casualties of of ai if you will you know of someone who is just so discouraged by it that they don't see the point in creating stuff anymore i i don't relate to that at all like i don't understand that i don't i don't feel at all discouraged from creating uh just because there are new tools people can use to make to make things. Uh, but that's that's the way he took it. And I think that there's some uh, generally artists who, you know, feel threatened by AI in that way, right? That they're, they're feeling like that, the, the, you know, that they're the, they're the wagon wheel maker as, as Henry Ford comes to town, you know, I don't, I don't look at it that way, but I think it's a, it's a real thing that, that people feel. So, but now that he's gone and, <laughs> He's basically joined the enemy. So, like, I don't understand what he's thinking at all. But I guess if he's having fun doing it, then great. I again, the AI generated stuff, it's a it's the best example I could think of to show that it's not nearly as good as the stuff that he made himself. Not anywhere close. Not at all. And I think that's generally true for AI artwork as well. That the best of AI artwork is still not as good as what a really good artist can do. And, you know, long may it be so, I guess is my my opinion on that. AI is only going to get better and better, of course, but there's there's a special something when someone has created something, like of their own of their own labors. There's an X factor there, you know, there's something special there that, that I am convinced AI will never be able to reproduce. Um, it may get end results that are very pretty and flashy and and impressive and have a, to reference one of our recent episodes, have a sense of spectacle that is that is jaw-dropping, that is, wow, that's, that's amazing. But there's always going to be a place for artists, uh, artists of all kinds, uh, because there is an element that just based on what, what we know about how generative AI works, it is impossible for generative AI to do anything but imitate, and in many cases, copy from real artists. So I hope that uh, that Sasha and other people who may feel that way, feel that discouraged, will just will remember that, that, uh, you know, this too shall pass. AI is not going away. That's not the kind of passing that I'm talking about, but... Uh, it's not, it's not here for your job, not, not, not some jobs, you know, some, some things I think AI will do and maybe should do, but, uh, you know, th there's still a place for, for people who create. So anyway, that's all I've got. That seems to be our news for this month. Yeah. Pretty short one. So uh, if you listeners, if you have any comments for us, feel free to leave that in a comment wherever you're watching or listening to this podcast. Uh, or if you prefer, we do check our email every once in a while. Talk at completelymachinima.com. We'd love to hear from you. We don't always air the comments here on the show, so you don't have to worry about you know, being uh, uh, embarrassed or anything like that. But we review them all. We share them with each other. Uh, we discuss them. And it does shape the direction of the show in many ways, in, in subtle ways. So uh, your feedback's very valuable to us. Uh, if nothing else, it, it it just lets us know that you're listening. So drop us a line sometime. So I'm Phil, and on behalf of my co-hosts, Tracy and Damien, that's our news episode for this month, and uh, have a great day.